What's up guys, this is Matt. This is the Raw Truth episode number six. I'm excited to do this today. This is my first time, so bear with me. Um, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be reading off questions that you guys gave me on Instagram in my Q&A and just kind of going through my thoughts based off of the question. Um, obviously, I wanna just address this first off. I had an overwhelming number of questions about Nick specifically. And within this part of the Q&A for me, I wanted to get into other things than just me directly working with him um, because the amount of questions that I had for that would have consumed this whole Q&A. All right, so just to say, I am excited to be working with him and more than anything, you know, we have had so much time and history together um, and I'm not at a point in my life where I want to start that process over again. You know, I, I love coaching. I absolutely love coaching. One of the questions in here is somebody's asking me the most of what I love about coaching, which I'll answer that. Um, but you know, Nick and I have, have invested a lot of time together. And uh, one of the things that's the hardest for me, it's, it's, it's the best and it's the hardest, is for me to be successful, I really feel that I need to invest in my guys. Um, I need to know them well, I need to know what drives them, what makes them tick, uh, what kind of turns them off from the sport, mentally, physically, emotionally. So there's all these things that go into what, to me, as a coach, makes a successful prep. Um, and Nick and I, on so many levels, have connected and we've found you know, a formula that works. So when, when he came back and you know, started to talk to me, uh, first and foremost, what I wanted to address with him was our friendship and had some things that were broken within our friendship. But outside of that, you know, the longer I thought about it, it's like, you know, and I told my wife this, like, I don't want to start from ground zero with guys all over again. Not that I'm not taking on any new guys, but the amount of success that we've achieved and the amount of work, dedication, lost family time, um, emotional stress, emotional celebration, all these things that we've gone through, like I am not mentally at a place to just start from ground zero with somebody all over again. So what I wanted to do is just, you know, give Nick another chance. I think we as humans all deserve another shot um, and just to give him my absolute best and to work together in that capacity. So that really is, you know, what I want to say regarding Nick. I want to get that question out of the way again, because I want this what, I, what I, I'm some, something that I'm looking forward to is you guys learning more about me through doing you know the raw truth and things like that outside of just the, you know the X's and O's of coaching um, because I think there's a lot that I can offer uh, there's a lot that I do in this building that's not just relating to coaching work so that way you guys can see some of that and also too I just kind of want to share my development as a person um, you know, as I'm starting to change and become older and, you know, the experience that I've had, just kind of pass those on to you guys, mistakes that I've made, celebrations that I've had, things of that nature. So we're going to jump into this today. Um, for those of you guys asking those Nick related questions, hopefully that kind of satisfies, you know, your ask. Um, I don't really see a need to get into, you know, what happened, why it happened, all that. But ultimately, we're back together. Um, I've committed to give him 100%. I know he's gonna do the same. And uh, you know, we just have so much history in the last, since 2018, um, that I just simply didn't wanna start over with somebody again in that, you know, in that aspect. So, all right, question number one here. If you can give your 18 year old self any advice, what would it be? So when I think about being 18, um, you know, a few things here. I would have, honestly, um, knowing that it's not a direct correlation to my success, I would have spent more time enjoying college. I, I potentially would have gone to a different school. Um, I made my college decision based off of two things. I made my college decision based off of my wife, um, and I also made my college decision based off of me getting an opportunity to play soccer there. Um, I was recruited to play soccer at the college that I went to. It was a Division II school, so that was the main reason why I went there. But yet, I would say that my quote-unquote college experience wasn't really one that I enjoyed. Um, because I, you know, I am a huge, I, I love sports, I love all sports, and, and really what my wife did, and, and to kind of go back and answer that part of the question, I didn't choose the college I chose because that's where my wife went. My wife was actually six hours away, but I initially wanted to actually come south. You know, as funny as it's, it, it's crazy as it is, I actually wanted to go to a school that was about 30 minutes south of where we currently live now. Little did I know that I would end up here one day. Um, but that's where I wanted to go. But I knew or I felt in my heart of hearts that if I went to West Palm Beach, if I went to college there and Jordan was in Lexington, Kentucky, that the reality of us working out wouldn't be that great, you know? So, and, and not to, to put this on you know, her or make me sound good, but I basically wanted to play soccer. I knew that. Um, I wanted to be with Jordan. I knew that. So I put myself in an environment where I could make both of those things happen. That being said, you know, college football, uh, college basketball, 
Those are things that I've loved ever since I was a kid. Um, and I wish I had more of those type experiences, just a bigger college atmosphere, environment, those traditions to be a part of those things. Because I was at a campus basically where on the weekends, everybody else wanted to go to one of those campuses where those you know bigger events were being held. And our campus was somewhat of like a ghost town. So that's one thing that I would tell myself. Also, you know, I really was not financially sound when I was younger. Some of the biggest trials, hardships that I've experienced were due to financial decisions that I made that weren't the best. You know, I, I could have cared less at one point about my credit score. Um, I just wasn't wise with those things. I wasn't saving money. Um, I was making purchases and, and having expenses that were well beyond my means. Um, and you know, that's one thing that I would do over because it would have it would have saved me a lot of heartache, you know. So for those of you guys that are younger, these are things that aren't taught in school, but like learn what, what credit score means, you know, what's the value there, is it important? Uh, that doesn't mean go out and get 12 credit cards, but like just really make sure that whatever you're doing, you're not going into debt on your card, you're not, you know, gaining interest month over month on your card, you're paying it off, little things like that. Understand, you know, what it takes to actually get a mortgage, understand what type of payment structure you have to have coming in to get the house that you want or actually not even to get the house that you want but to get the house that you need at some point to then set yourself up for success in the future you know just little things like that um, you know in terms of there's so many things that I'm thankful for that I'm appreciative of you know so really a lot of my life I wouldn't want to change I have very very few regrets but I would have I, I wish I would have cared more and I wish I would have gotten you know heated the advice of my parents um, went further and learned more on my own about you know what finance you know what finances I really needed to care about uh, what to not put on the back burner um, hospital bills need to be paid on time you know things like that which kind of sounds so elementary now but at that point in my life when I was you know younger 20s those are things that I didn't care about um, I have a hair in my eye or something so anyway that's what I would say you know uh, I, I have a lot of people that also ask me about you know I'm a younger coach. What does that look like for you? I could give you guys a few pieces of advice. Um, obviously, I personally feel that your background in education is very important, very important. But I also don't feel like that makes you. And I think what made me successful early on was the fact that I was getting the X's and O's of education that I needed to then have those credentials underneath my name. Um, but I didn't base basically my success off of those credentials that were underneath my name. And I just continued to work hard, uh, seek out knowledge, from any place that you can, you know, listen, seek out, heed advice, heed wisdom, and then kind of base your own and build your own philosophy off of those things. And this is coaching, this is business, this is life, you know, so I really just tried to seek out as much information as I could early on. And then within that, I, you know, thought to myself, okay, this is valuable, this is BS, this might be, you know, somewhere in the midline. And I started to kind of navigate what I felt like was important and what I felt like wasn't important. And then obviously as my experience continued to go on, my basis of education, experiences, these things all kind of then built what my current thought process formulation is on you know how I coach athletes now. But really more than anything, if I could get anything across to you is just coach people how you would want to be coached. And then at the end of the day, treat people, I mean this is a golden rule, treat people how you'd want to be treated. Um, and I think that's gonna replicate so far into building a name for yourself and not only building a name for yourself in terms of wins, losses, but who you are and who your integrity is as a person, which I feel like is so important. So that kind of answers two questions in one, uh, but I wanted to start off there because I feel like we have, uh, not I feel, I know that we have a younger audience within those of you guys that support and believe in us as a company. And really, you know, if I could give you guys any advice, it's just really take the time to be financially sound, and, and, and I don't mean financially sound in terms of the numbers in your bank account, but I mean educate educate yourself on what financially sound means, and then with that, with it, within your means, whatever that looks like for you within that moment in time, whether you're college, whether you're going into college, whether you're coming out of college, just make sure you're, <clears throat> you're responsible with your money. That's a huge thing, all right? Okay, what was the biggest turning point in my coaching career that really put me ahead? I feel like I, <clears throat> have two different answers for this. Both of them are correct. Um, I feel like I have the answer, or I wanna share the answer of what I, I feel like my acceptance by everybody outside was, and then also what I feel like was the biggest turning point internally for me, where I truly believed in myself and also 
felt this huge sense of relief of me not having to need to accomplish any more to basically prove my worth. So uh, moment number one was 2015, me working with Dallas McCarver. Uh, Dallas, through Justin Compton, I wanna mention Justin Compton as well because Justin Compton was the one that recommended Dallas to work with me. Um, and many of you guys have heard, you know, if you've ever heard a podcast about me, I'm sure you've heard this story. So I don't need to go into a ton of detail. But I wanna give Justin and Dallas credit because basically Justin believed in me enough to recommend Dallas to come to me. Dallas believed in me enough to then work with me. Uh, my first Olympian, my first big moment on Olympia stage was with Dallas. Um, and that kind of was when I really proved myself, you know, and again, for you young coaches out there, for you guys that are might want to be coaches, I think at some point in time, we are all given our shot. And really, it's, it's what you do with that opportunity that really matters. You know, you have some guys, if you want to call them haters, if you just want to call them negative people, they've, they've kind of coined me in the past of, oh, Matt only works with genetic elite, this, that, and the other. Well, Phil Jackson, let's, let's bring up Phil Jackson, let's bring up Hani Rambaugh, let's bring up Chris Aceto. These guys were all given opportunities with quote unquote genetic elite. It's what they did with those people when they were given those opportunities that matters. You know, I think a lot of people are given their opportunity with somebody very, very good and they miss it. Um, you know, and then, and then, and then where do you go? You know, so for me, that Dallas was that first opportunity. Um, and obviously I had, you know, we had a lot of great wins together. I had a lot of great wins with other athletes, you know, right around the time, but he really kind of put me up there to then other guys believing in me, wanting me to coach them. So that was kind of moment number one. Moment one for me personally, where I felt like I, I really made it and what the turning point was, is when Sean won the Olympia in 2020. Um, up to that, that point in my career, and again, going back to you younger coaches, I really truly feel that as a younger coach, you also need to be driving up your own physique progress because there's nothing better to me than a testament of not only one walk in the walk, being a test, you know, being a living example of what you can do yourself, um, you know, but just continuing in this content age to be able to drive content with your own physique and create a culture of what you believe needs to be implemented in, in coaching, you know? So for me, that was all about hard work. It wasn't about, um, you know, trying to be overly cute or sexy with my movements, but really just showing hard work on a day-to-day -day basis. This was kind of what I was known for on Instagram and then showing my progress physique wise and then also performance wise in the gym through that. So 2020 comes around. Um, in 2019, Sean finished third at the Olympia. In 2020, obviously we know COVID happened and I was really, really headstrong on going pro in 2020. So that year, the I believe in 2020, the Olympia happened and then shortly thereafter the Olympia was the, uh, the nationals. So I was gonna compete in nationals. Uh, in June of 2020, I completely ruptured my pec, completely 100% tear, um, and that kind of really set things. And I'm honestly so thankful that that moment happened for me because through that moment, my eyes got opened up to, some, to, to what was really truly important in life and, and the things that I was missing out on, the, the areas of focus that I wasn't hitting, that I was neglecting. So anyway, tore my pec in June of 2020. Obviously, the, at the end of that year in December, Sean wins the Olympia. <laughs> and actually, now that I'm rem remembering back, Nationals was, was before the Olympia that year. But anyway, I wanted to compete at Nationals. I, my goal was to turn pro, and then I was gonna go to the Olympia after that. Well, what I realized is, is by what Sean did, that was going to far exceed anything that I could personally do with my physique. So I felt this huge sense of release, uh, relief of, one, I accomplished a goal that I've wanted to accomplish for so long, um, you know, people can tell you that they get into coaching to help people because they love to see people transform. And yes, I love all those things, but ultimately as, as early as I can remember, I love to win, you know, and I got into coaching to win and I wanted to win at the highest level. Um, so, you know, kind of connecting these two guys again, when Dallas passed away, the morning Dallas passed away, Sean called me. He said, I'm going to be your first Olympian. Um, so we were able to accomplish that in 2020 and I'm going to try not to get emotional, but so those two kind of were like the, the big aha moments for me of I, I, you know, I did what I set out to do. Um, and, you know, again, I, I do this to win. You know, I want to take care of my guys. I want my guys to know that I treat them different and that I care about them and I care about them on a personal level. But to me, I want to win, you know, and, that, and that's why I've always done that. So Sean winning was just this huge relief for me. 
um, in the sense that, you know, at the highest level, I proved myself. And not only that, but we proved ourselves with a, with a physique that I believe he won around, I wanna say one, Sean, don't hate me if, I, if I'm wrong. I wanna say around 168 or 172, somewhere in that range. Um, so we're like, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 45, 50 pounds under the weight cap, uh, which is tremendous in and of itself. So that kind of is, is the moment for me where I really feel like I did something, I accomplished something uh, big. And I've had, you know, my, my mentality on coaching has been different ever since that day. Obviously, you know, in terms of people reaching out to me and other athletes that have come to me since then, it's, it's been a big difference as well. But those are the two turning points for me. All right, next question. What traits have you applied to your coaching business to make them make you successful? Wait, oh, wait, hold on. What traits have you applied to your coaching slash business to make you successful in that? Um, you know, this is a, I, I, I specifically picked this question because I feel like, again, within the demographic of the people that we have that support Raw, the customers of Raw, the fans of Raw, I wanted to answer this because Dom and I on the back end, um, we've had so many conversations about bodybuilders and about how dedicated bodybuilders are, but it seems like, and guys, I'm not trying to, to talk badly about anybody here. I'm just being as real and, and raw as I can with you. Um, it seems like a lot of bodybuilders dedication starts and ends in the gym and, and it starts and ends with their meals. And that's about as far as it goes. But what I think Dom and I have excelled so, so well in is that basically we put and we, the, the dedication that we learn from bodybuilding and, and that regimented schedule and just basically Groundhog's Day every day and pushing yourself to the limit and, and all those things that we loved about bodybuilding, we essentially just took that mindset and rather than putting all that energy into bodybuilding, we transferred that into the rest of our lives, into business, into different business ventures, into relationships. Um, and that's what's helped us grow into what we are today. So really for me, um, you know, I'm very, very internally driven. And, you know, when you take somebody that's very internally driven, um, there's another question about, am I satisfied? You know, that I wanted to answer as well, but take somebody that's internally driven. And then if you add all the components of what makes a su successful bodybuilder, um, never missing a meal, you know, being super regimented, making sure your hydration's on point, making sure that your sleep quality is always there, making sure that you're recovering so that way you can progress in the gym, I don't want to say never missing a training session because I think there's value in that, but you know, not allowing yourself to miss needed training sessions, all those things, all that energy, emphasis, time that you put every single day into that regimented schedule for bodybuilding. Think about what you could do if you put, put that type of effort and energy into everything else, you know, but whereas with most bodybuilders, what they do is they're so consumed and maybe drained and maybe they can't think outside of that box that they're putting other things continuously on the back burner in terms of their life, in terms of business decisions, in terms of life after bodybuilding, that's then hindering them once bodybuilding's done. You know, so for me, I think really, guys, the, the, the mindset and the model that bodybuilding creates can be so positive if you allow it to be. But yet it can be also be so handicapping if, if that's all your focus is all the time, 24 seven. Um, never allowing yourself to engage with people. You know, there's, it, it depends on how you look at it, but if you take the positives of bodybuilding and apply it to the rest of your life, which is what I've done within my coaching, which is what I've done within our businesses, there's so much good that can come from that. Okay, next question, and I kind of touched on this on the last one. I thought this was a great question. Um, are you satisfied in your life right now, or is there something else that you want to achieve? And I want to answer this cautiously and carefully because I don't think that, I, me as an individual, I don't think that I'm ever satisfied, um, but I am happy. You know, I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with the people in my life. I'm happy with where I'm at in my life, uh, but I'm not content, if that makes sense. So really, what more can I achieve? And I wanna talk about on a personal level, I wanna talk about on a family level, um, and then also obviously we can talk coaching. So on a personal level, I think the biggest goal for my life is just to create financial stability and security for my family. You know, that that to me is ultimate freedom um, of, of working because I wanna work and not working because I have to work, you know, and that really is the goal that I'm trying to achieve for, for my life. Um, and more than that, I wanna be a dad that's really active with my boys, especially as they grow up. And so I think 
now, you know, and I think both parents are equally important throughout every phase of a child's life, but there's gonna be years coming up with my boys where they're really gonna need a dad to be intentional with them. Um, and I wanna make sure that I'm there for those times. I wanna be able to pick them up in the afternoon from school. And I want to be able to not have to be connected to this all afternoon. I want to be able to go to their practices and I want to be able to watch them, um, give them feedback, give them praise, give them constructive criticism, whatever they need as they continue to advance and whatever they want to do. That's really important to me. Uh, so I want to be a dad that's, that's truly available for them and not a dad that's available but yet on the phone 24-7. Now if you're watching this and that's, that's your way, um, or, and I'm not cr critiquing that, or, or maybe that's the absolute best you can do. That's, that's not what I'm saying either. But what I'm saying is, you know, I've just set some pretty significant mile markers in my life of, you know, when the, by the time the boys are this age, this is how active I want to be in their life um, and making sure that I'm doing those things. So that, you know, just the financial freedom to be able to do that is something that I really, really want to do. Um, you know, and also I want to share this with you. you know, I'm happy to share this with you guys, but I've had some pretty intentional conversations with a few close friends the past few weeks. And as you know, my boys now are three and five, but what I really realize in them is I want to be a dad that when they have the, the choice of who they want to hang out with, when they have the freedom of choice in that, they're choosing to still hang out with their mom and their dad. You know, so that to me, that's like one of the biggest, I don't even want to say stressors because it's not a stressor, but like one of my biggest goals in my life right now is to make sure that I'm a dad to my boys that they want to spend time with me when they have the freedom of choice to spend time with whoever they want. And I don't mean holidays and, and forced events, but I mean just like truly just want to spend genuine time, um, you know, with me when they grow up. Um, so that, that to me is a huge goal. And then, uh, you know, obviously on the business side, we have, we have huge, tremendous goals for Raw and Revive. Um, you know, and I, I wanna speak about those more so as a team of leaders that we have, a team, a team of owners that we have. But on a personal front, on a coaching front, I set out for myself a few years ago, I wanted to win Olympias in three different divisions. So that's, that's a personal goal that I have for myself within coaching, which I think I can very, I, I can accomplish. Um, and I don't want to put a timestamp on that, so to speak, but you know, kind of like I started off this discussion talking about Nick um, and our relationship and also not kind of restarting from ground zero, as I, as I think I mentioned it. Like, I, I know by the time that I'm, you know, another 10 years, 10, 12 years, I'm probably going to be done coaching. So I do have somewhat of a time cap on myself of, of when I want to accomplish these goals. Um, but again, you know, like I said about the kind of the two mile markers of me of when I felt like I made it as a coach, to me, ultimate success, if you are viewed as a coach, should come down to, again, how you treat people, but wins and losses. Um, you know, so that, that's been a goal for a long time of mine now is to be able to win the Olympia in three different divisions. That's why I have a tremendous amount of respect for Flex, uh, Flex and what Flex and Neil did. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Hani, you know, and the amount of titles that he's won in multiple divisions. I think four now, um, which I think is the, the most ever because he's won figure, men's physique, men's open, 212, you know, which is extremely impressive. Um, you know, and that's kind of a goal that I've had for myself is to at least win in three different divisions. All right, next question. Uh, how many working sets per training session do I recommend? And this, this obviously all comes down to what you actually view as a working set, um, the effort versus volume conversation. And just to kind of keep it brief, I am somebody that truly believes that driving up progress over time and having performance markers in the gym for the greater amount of people, that's gonna yield a better result over time. Um, so for me, I really like to drive the effort high to keep your rep execution standardized. And what I mean by that is, is really kind of overly obsessing on what you're getting out of each rep, making sure it's perfect, having that be a standard variable, and then driving up your load, you know, your loading schemes within that. So for me, it's really important that one, you're not within the, the system of how I like to coach, that you're not counting warm-ups as working sets. And then you're also not just continuing to constantly fatigue yourself within your training session before you're actually getting to the true working sets. Because really, as you're acclimating loads, if you're just accumulating a bunch of fatigue within those loads, and, and those loads are not loads that are gonna change your physique for the better, then you're honestly taking away from the work that you can do at the, those top end sets 
to then change the look, all right? So for me, I like to keep total sets to failure based off of body part. I would say anywhere from six to 12 a session with 12 kind of being dedicated more so to the larger body part, six to the smaller, whether it's delts, triceps, biceps, things like that. What age did I start coaching? Um, I started coaching, and I, I, this is sad, but I'm getting old, so I have to kind of remember these dates now. Um, so my first bodybuilding show I did, I believe it was the spring of 2020. I did the NPC Natural Northern Ohio, which is the Dave Lieberman show. Um, I did that with my best friend, Jim Haymore. My, uh, my Jim Haymore. My best friend, Jim, actually got me into lifting. Uh, we started lifting together in seventh grade, I believe. And he was, so he is, I wanna say 18 months older than me, um, but we're in the same grade. So his maturation was just well beyond what mine was. Um, and, and he had a very, very sound training philosophy. He actually trained with uh, Leo Costa's Titan Method in seventh and eighth grade. So for those of you guys that don't know what that is, if you know who Scott Stevenson is, basically what Scott Stevenson has done has been a lot of the principles that Leo Costa put into place. So that being said, you know, that was kind of my initial start to, to the training. I competed for the first time with Jim in 2020. Um, and I always want to give credit here too, because yeah, I had the, the education. Um, yes, I had the eagerness to learn, but I also had a very, very good crop of initial athletes that I worked with. So the first three athletes, the first three people that I ever coached as a coach were local people to me. One wasn't local, but we were friends previous. All three of those people are pros. So I helped turn uh, the first guy pro. He's actually, he turned pro at, uh, in middleweight at nationals. The first girl I worked with turned pro at USA's in figure. And then the other, the other guy that I worked with, he didn't turn pro with me, but his first show after we worked together, he turned pro. So what I'm alluding to is that my initial crop of athletes obviously genetically were very good, but that also helped bring other athletes to me from that point moving forward. So I think I officially started coaching um, more so I would say just locally, and this was 2010, so the end of 2010, the start of 2011. Um, I was able to actually start working with a good deal of people in 2012. Um, I also got married in 2012 and moved to Lexington, Kentucky at the time. And then, you know, this was kind of the big jump for me. In 2013, I was the personal training manager at LA Fitness. Um, and I just wasn't happy with the job. And I talked to my wife and I said, you know, I want to just do this full time. Um, and what did full time mean for me? It meant that every moment that I wasn't coaching within a normal work day, I was either creating content on Facebook, I was learning more, I was reading pretty much everything that Alan Argon ever wrote, ever, um, or, or the research that he was involved in. Um, there were several other guys like Alan that I was just fully invested into learning as much as I possibly could from. Uh, the one guy that I, I specifically want to mention that wrote the Stubborn Fat Loss Protocol, Lyle McDonald. Um, I love his, you know, he's, he's probably one of the ult most ultimate trolls online, or was at one time, so he doesn't have a very good reputation, but I think he's a brilliant mind. Um, every book that he's written, I've read, and a lot of my initial coaching philosophy in terms of, you know, proper execution within diet strategies came from him, so I want to give him credit for that. I personally also had very, very good coaches. Um, you know, the two that I initially that I want to give credit to is Jason Theobald and also Alberto Nunez. Um, Jason and, and Alberto work extremely different and through them working extremely different, I was able to pick up on very, very good things that I carry through this day through, with both of them. Um, I feel like at the time, Jason was exceptional with refeeds and refeed strategies. I learned a ton from him. Um, Alberto was tremendous for me in terms of how he related to his athletes. And again, kind of going back to more than just the X's and O's of communication. Those are the things that I really grasped from him. And I was like, okay, I want to formulate my own coaching philosophy off of the, these two men. Um, so that was very early on. And then in 2013, I got another huge opportunity. Neil Hill essentially agreed to mentor me. Um, at the time, he was living in India, and I'll, I'll never forget this. I was trying to reach out to him, and I honestly don't even remember who I got the initial contact from, but I, I got Neil's information, and um, I was trying to reach out to him. I texted him a few times, and then randomly one night, it was like 10.45 at night, 
um, he sends me a text and says, hey mate, can I, can I call you in three hours? Okay, so now it's looking at like two o'clock in the morning and I told my wife, I'm like, look, like I'm not gonna miss this call. Um, so I stayed up, talked to him and we still have uh, a great relationship to this day. He's been one of my biggest supporters, one of my biggest advocates within the coaching industry. My two best friends outside of our circle here within coaching is Neil um, and Andrew Vu. You know, so those are the guys that I've surrounded myself with and those are the guys that uh, I feel like we have a real rela relationship. So like the, the drama that's within bodybuilding, the drama that's, that's within the fitness industry, that's not something that we entertain. Um, and I think that's why we've had a good you know relationship to this day. So that's kind of how I got my initial start and then the people that I want to give credit to for my initial start. Favorite clean cheat meal. Um, I feel like I'm a retired amateur, not very good bodybuilder. So I don't even consider it a cheat meal anymore. Um, but when I was bodybuilding, if you want to go quote unquote clean cheat meal, even though that's a very silly word, I would go with Chipotle and sushi. Um, and those still are two of my favorite things to eat to this day. Um, but that's what I would say. And obviously my other favorite is Chick-fil-A. I would not consider that clean. Um, but what I did notice from Chick-fil-A, and you know, again, if you guys have followed me for a long time, you know this story. But in 2018, 2017, when I was really, really pushing hard, you know, before I did USA's, I got sick with the flu twice and I was losing weight. And what I found was through eating Chick-fil-A, like I wasn't feeling that like disgusting bloat that most of those kind of junkier, heavier, dense calorie meals caused. So that's where the Chick-fil-A refeeds came from, but I would not consider that clean. Um, I don't even know, you know, Chris would say that Chipotle is not clean. I'll argue that. No, I'm kidding. It's not clean either. Um, but on the cleaner end of the spectrum, I would say sushi, essentially just nigiri. When I go to Chipotle, I ask for their plain white rice. So it doesn't have as much oil and obviously the cilantro is not in it. And then obviously you can control the other variables like cheese, sour cream, guacamole things that are gonna drive up the fat content really high, you can you know control those based off of what your needs are, macros, things of that nature, All right? Um, what else was I gonna say about food? Uh, the food in South Florida is probably some of the best I've ever had though, so there's that. Not clean either, but just throwing that out there. Um, how do I like being a dad? Um, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me, for sure. You know, and it, it's basically being a dad now drives or influences every decision that I make. And, and at one time, you know, and, and I, I've really tried the past few years to encourage younger dads or maybe first time dads with this, but like, first of all, being a parent is extremely hard. Um, and in order to be successful at it, you have to be extremely selfless. So that is something that's learned, you know, and, and for one, we as men, we don't have that innate just, in, you know, connection of carrying the baby inside of us that a woman has. Um, and just like anything else, if you, know, if you want to go back to the business world, you want to go back to bodybuilding, anything you want to be successful in, you have to work hard at. Um, it's, it isn't by chance. And, and being a dad is no different. You have to work hard at being a good parent. Um, and it's something that I've had to learn. It's something that I've had to go through trials with. You know, there's times where I wasn't putting my kids first. Um, and, and not that I was ever neglecting them, but it was just, it was not my first thought. Uh, and now, you know, even even right now, like I'm at a point where I would love to work out every single day if I could, you know, but within the days that we have, you know, I have a certain amount of hours where I have to get things that are non-negotiables for me done. Um, and one of the things that I even hate to say that it's negotiable now, but working out for me is somewhat negotiable because if basically I have an hour and a half left of my day and that hour and a half can be spent playing with my boys and being intentional with them or being, you know, the drive to the gym, training, drive home, like a lot of the times being with my boys win that conversation. You know, that being said, I do think that being mentally healthy um, needs to be present in order for you to be able to be the dad or mom or parent that you need to effectively be. So I think a healthy workout regimen program, whatever you want to call it, is a very important part of that. Um, but it's just balancing that out now, you know, so some days, you know, even my wife says, Matt, I think you need to go to the gym because you're going to be happier when you get home. 
Um, you know, so it's, it's about balancing that out. But being a dad is, is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, you know, the pride that I have, the love that I have for my boys, being able to see them grow up, you know, every day. One thing that I'm thankful for is that I get to wake up and see my boys every morning. I know a lot of dads don't have that opportunity, um, but you know, I get to wake up with them every morning. I get to see them walk out of their room, you know, see them run around the house, have breakfast, rush out the door, go to school. And I get to be a part of that process. So I'm really thankful for that. What's my favorite thing about coaching? Um, seeing people s accomplish more than what they felt like they could accomplish. You know, seeing that look on their face, um, the relationships that come from coaching, uh, the ability to impact other people's lives, and then like I've said many times so far, you know, just winning. I, I love to win. Um, I love it. I, I just absolutely love everything about winning and just seeing the result and the effort and, and all the time and dedication just come to fruition. Okay, last question. I think this is my last one. Oh, two more. All right, second to last question. What's the best way to focus on lat width? All right, this is one of my pet peeves, so I wanted to answer this question specifically, but a muscle is gonna grow from origin to insertion, okay? So you can't specifically force a muscle to grow one direction that it's not gonna grow the other direction. So you can't just get wider without adding more thickness or depth to that muscle as well. Now, you could just specifically train your lat, and let's look at the, you know, the side profile of somebody. You could just specifically train your lat, so yes, the lat muscle is on the outside of the back, so yes, as a byproduct of that, that person is going to get wider, but they're not just going to get wider without adding any more depth to their physique. So really for me, when it comes to back training, I would focus on where your elbow is finishing in relation to your trunk, okay? So where your elbow is finishing into the, in relation to the midline of your body, and then basically going through four different sectors of tucking in a little bit out here, here, and then here, and basically making sure that you're hitting all four of those elbow finishing points within every workout. And that, to me, within different variations of exercise selection is gonna be the greatest way to accomplish properly getting your back to be complete. Um, don't just focus on width without focusing on depth. The same thing for people come up to me all the time. How do I get my upper part of my chest to grow? Or how do I get the bottom part of my chest to grow? Well, these fibers are all connected, okay? So it's gonna go from here to here, origin to insertion, vice versa, you know? Um, depending on how you guys are looking at this. So that being said, you can't just specifically target one fiber type, one fiber section, cross-sectional fiber without hitting the rest of it, all right? Nor should you really wanna do that. Um, ultimately, just focus on making the entire fiber strand bigger, which is gonna grow obviously with width as well as thickness, all right? Last question. Um, I think I actually kind of already answered this, but how did Dallas and I meet, and then how did I separate coaching and friendship? I kind of talked, I talked about how Dallas and I met, but the reason why I pulled this question out specifically is because it's asking about how did you separate coaching and friendship? Um, and that to me is one of the biggest struggles that I have within coaching in that, um, again, I truly believe that for me to be successful, I need to have a bond with them that's deeper than the X's and O's of communication. Um, especially when you're really trying to accomplish greatness within the sport, whether that's at the national level, the pro level. But that being said, there is a point when you get so close that you allow the emotional aspect of your relationship to influence what should be no gray area, black or white decision making. Um, and that's something that I've struggled with. I think that's part of the reason why Dallas and I honestly split to begin with. Thankfully, we got back together. Um, you know, and, and other athletes as well. That's something I struggle with with Nick. So that's one of the things that I'm really trying to work on is not blurring the lines of, yes, I can be your friend. Yes, I could be your coach. But like even, even now for the next 10 weeks with Nick, it's strictly business. You know, I'm not really so much worried about being his friend as more so as making sure that I deliver on the job and expectations that he needs from me as a coach that I know that he was missing. That to me is my number one priority. And I, all, and I have to constantly remind myself of, okay, like Matt, like, because the emotional side of me wants to get attached in that way, but also like, is that truly what's best for them? Or are we going to get attached in that way so that way when it does come to crunch time and I have to make, I have to be very effective in my decision-making process, am I going to allow the look on somebody's face to then sway my decision-making of what truly needs to happen? 
You know, so that's, again, I wanted to kind of point that out because it's, it's a struggle, it's a challenge. It's something that I, I have to continue to remind myself. I'm not always perfect at it, um, but that to me is, is, is knowing how to separate those lines because in the past I've not done that well um, and it's caused issues. So anyway, hope you guys enjoy this. Um, if you guys hated this, comment below. Um, if you want me to do more of these, comment below. If you hated it, just be nice about it. Um, and yeah, that's it.